Cool. Thank you for coming and happy AAPI Heritage Month. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Um, my name is M Michelle Zhang. I'm the founder of Society of Heart Sea Lights, Yuan Shi in Chinese. I, um, we've been doing a lot of online and uh, offline events since uh, we started, since uh, pandemic started <laughs> too. And I believe this is our <coughs> very first uh, one in-person event at our uh, historic uh, space here on the Alameda. Wow. Um, today I, uh, I'm so excited to have our two very special guests here with us. And let me introduce uh, each of them. <laughs> Dion Lim, uh, an Emmy award-winning TV news anchor and the author of Make Your Moment, the Savvy Woman, Woman's Communication Playbook to get, Getting the Success You Want. I definitely need a copy. <laughs> <laughs> and she was also named alongside Vice President Kamala Harris and other prominent AAPI leaders to the list of 2021 uh, Gold House A100 um, Most Influential Asians. Ooh, ooh, ooh. This AAPI uh, Heritage Month, Dion received a coveted invitation to the White House to uh, where she celebrated the accomplishments of uh, prominent Asian Americans and met President Biden and uh, Vice President uh, 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 Kamala uh, Harris. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, later you can share sure. with us a little bit inside information about White House. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and we're really proud and excited to have our dear friends Michelle Miao mm -hmm. join us. She's a uh, leading LGBTQ host and a producer of the Michelle Miao Show and produces programs at the iconic Commonwealth Club, where she also serves on their Board of Governors. Michelle has interviewed many, many famous and uh, notable people, uh, previously served as uh, president of uh, San Francisco Pride and has been the co-host of San Francisco, San Francisco Pride Parade broadcast since 2006. Ooh. I highly recommend checking out her programs at uh, one of our favorite places, Commonwealth Club. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. We're in for treats this uh, afternoon um, uh, of Memorial Day weekend. And it's great to be together, especially in light of the many lives lost to senseless uh, violence. It feels more important than ever to be together with our community. For today's first, uh, first uh, chat, we'll have about 30 minutes uh, discussion and uh, 15 minutes uh, Q&A. So we have uh, the, the uh, paper here and a pen, and if you have questions, write it down and we can pass to uh, our uh, moderator. So uh, <laughs> without further ado, please silence your phones and uh, open your heart. Let's enjoy uh, the conversation. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to the Society of Hearts Delight and of course, Pat, and how wonderful you know, it is to be here in this very special place. It's so beautiful, right, Dion? I'm gonna move in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need their space, their yeah. space for both of us. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, let's jump right into it because it's fresh, you know, your trip to the White House. Oh, How was yeah. it? Let me tell you, the White House doesn't tell you a lot about what happens. You just get the invitation and I actually thought it was fake because it popped in my email and I said, how did they get my email? And a colleague of mine said, well, it is the White House. They probably know everything about you already. And it wasn't until I registered and I saw that it went through the RSVP that it was happening. And then as I was emailing them back and forth saying, oh, can you tell me who's going to be involved, what the program is going to be like? They said, we are unable to provide that information for you. <laughs> so I just basically showed up and little did I know that we would be celebrating so many Asian Americans from all across the country, people who had just been notified of the invitation, maybe even as early as a week before the event. And it was funny, this is my small anecdote that I like to share with everybody from my from White House trip, is that when I spoke to President Biden 
I told him about the work that I was doing with ABC and how grateful I was that the administration was paying attention as opposed to some other administrations in the past. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I got a little bit choked up and he took my phone and he said, let's take a selfie. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, he knows how to take a selfie. So <laughs> the sun is shining because it's the height of the afternoon and he's taking it and there's a huge shadow across my face. And I think to myself, this may be my very only time that I will ever meet a sitting president. <laughs> so I said, Mr. Biden, could you please move your arm slightly because maybe the lighting will be better if you tilt your body. <laughs> and he obliged, he was great. He was really friendly and, and nice about it, great sport. So I have that shot. That's my one memento uh, from the White House. <laughs> oh, that was so awesome. Yeah. That was fun. Well, speaking of your work and it being highlighted, um, let's start with that moment in which, you know, you realize that you needed to make the commitment and focus on the incidents that are affecting the Asian community. And obviously, as we know, if we see you grace our news, uh, these incidents are anti-Asian hate and violence incidents. I remember it like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. There was a 22 second video that came into my Instagram direct messages, and it was of a man who looked eerily like my father. He had a wider nose, he had this bomber jacket on, and he was being beaten, he was being humiliated, he was being barked at by dozens of spectators, including young children, and this was in the Bayview District of San Francisco. And my heart sank, and for the very first time I thought, my goodness, even though I've been the first Asian American to be at the helm of all these different newscasts in parts of the country that are non-diverse, like North Carolina and in Florida and in Kansas, of all places, now it was time for me to use my seat at the table and do something. So, as you can imagine, being in an editorial boardroom where decisions about coverage are being made, I thought to myself, what is going to be the difference between all the stories that I've pitched in the past in all of those places and getting a no versus me getting this greenlit and for us to run with it and show the whole world because there was a fire that was in my belly that I didn't know had existed until those 22 seconds. And I said, this is a very violent very distressing video, but I'm going to show it for everyone because they need to see it uncensored, they need to hear it, they need to hear this man wailing at the top of his lungs. And that was the moment I said, let's, let's do this. And fortunately, everyone was on board because they understood the gravity and that set off a firestorm after that. That one person who didn't want you to necessarily cover all the abuse was your mom. Could you tell us? Oh my God. Yeah, could you tell us why and you know what was behind what was behind that? Yeah, for many people in this room, um, if you grew up in a very traditional Asian American household, Asian household, you know that it is best practice to keep your nose clean, mm -hmm. keep your head down. The nail that sticks up gets hammered down. And I remember this growing up even, when there was something that I didn't agree with. Or I remember my mother tripped in a parking lot of a supermarket because there was a manhole just randomly in the parking lot on the pavement. And she said, oh, I think I twisted my ankle. I said, mom, why don't you tell the store about it so that way nobody else gets injured also? And she said, no, no one will listen. Or no, not a big deal. And I thought to myself, well, that's not quite right, but I didn't understand why that was significant at the time. So for me, when I started covering a lot of these attacks because of xenophobia, racism, uh, etc. My mother thought that it was bringing shame onto the Asian people because why not elevate our stories and our celebrations and the things that we've accomplished? Why are you bringing to light people who are being humiliated or people being made to feel like they're not part of society, discriminated against? And in her purview, it was uh, seen as a detriment, not a way to get to progress. And that was really hurtful. That was um, at the height of the pandemic, and I have not had the heart to read that email again. I've saved it, though, because it was such a significant, um, I guess, milestone marker in some way. Mm -hmm. um, but if I can follow through on that, um, when I did make my first appearance on ABC's 2020 on a Stop the Hate special, my father sent me an email and said he was proud of me. So that 
for the very first time told me that. So it kind of equaled itself out. And I think my mom is proud of me now too. She just won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to follow up. Yeah. What about now? I mean, I don't, I don't think that we imagined that we would be seeing, you know, the amount of incidents and, the, and, and so quickly and so fast, right? I think Stop AAPI Hate started gathering and collecting that information at the beginning of the pandemic. And we're talking like a 300% jump or, or something, you know, something unimaginable like that. And so for you, what was that like? I couldn't wrap my head around it because you have to understand before I covered all of these things, I was covering the Oscars on the red carpet, talking to J-Lo, or at least trying to get J-Lo to talk to me. <laughs> or I would go on the road with the Golden State Warriors for the NBA Finals, things like that. So to wrap my head around the facts and the figures gave me, I guess, credibility when I did report on these stories because you would not believe how many people to this day still say it is hashtag fake news or people who are blaming the media for blowing it out of proportion, when really what you see on TV, what you see on my Instagram is 1%, 2% of what really happens. It's just a matter of how many people will speak out and use their voice. And that's also kind of going back to my mother and the way I grew up and how we were always taught not to use our voice. Look what happens when you do, when you convince someone, when you gain their trust, that's what can be the result is that this movement can begin. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, one of the arguments that came out of even, I think, reading the comments from every time you reported on these incidents, people would say, well, it's not, it's not race related. It's yeah. not necessarily a hate incident. Uh, you know, the Asian community is not being targeted. What is your response? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, if only I could say what I really felt to all of these people online, because uh, social media really is the armpit of the internet, as Lady Gaga very poignantly said. Um, look, to those who don't believe it's true, to those who don't believe it's really happening, that's why I am so adamant on seeking out a surveillance video. I get a lot of criticism for people who say, oh, you're exploiting these victims. You are uh, showcasing them at the lowest points of their lives. But the importance of that is that people need to see the gravity of it. Unless you can see it for your own two eyes, it does not become real. And I spent most of my career covering breaking news as well, right? I mean, you can go to a, a wildfire, you can go to a mass shooting. All of these incidents are tragic in their own way, but until you see somebody whose story is so similar to your own, because I bet each and every person, no matter what color you are, has a story of discrimination. And for those who say it's not a hate crime, we know what it is because it's a feeling, but of course, when you go to law enforcement, they can't write on a rep police report, oh, there's a gut feeling that this was racially motivated. But we know from fact, we know from those who are ethnic studies professors that Asian Americans have this, there's this model minority myth that is looming over us, that has the false, that gives the public the false perception that we carry a lot of cash, that we aren't gonna report, that we are quiet and meek. And for me as someone who is none of those things, I think that's my job in convincing people that, yeah, even though it does not escalate on paper to being a hate crime, we know that with the way that history has shaped the Asian American story, that indeed it is hate motivated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite clips of you is, uh, I think you're questioning uh, San Francisco's district, um, Chesa Boudin. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you're, you're being very, you know, very frank and, and honest with the questions that you wanted to ask. And so the question for you is, what do you think is a solution to this? Or, you know, what's the root cause? Mm -hmm. And then what are some, some suggestions you have? Yeah, there is a very deep rooted problem because all law enforcement sources that I've had have told me off the record they won't say it on camera, but Dion, this is America's dirty little secret. Just because we're seeing this surge, yes, it is prompted by certain rhetoric that has been used, right? The perception that Asian Americans have brought or have our carriers of COVID-19, but this has been a problem in our society for decades and history 
can tell you that. You can open an, an Asian studies book and you'll see the feelings of being excluded from this country, the Chinese Exclusion Act, landmark cases like of Vincent Chins. You can look those up as well and see. Um, I wish I had an answer, a, a black and white answer, but I do think it's not just the education. I think people need to understand that we are not all the same, this monolith that you know gets get, <laughs> that we get lumped into but also i think policies do need to change and as a journalist i can't advocate for one or another ethics wise but i can say as a human being that if you have people who are committing crimes over and over and over again and if i can showcase and be an activator or not an activist and showcase the people who are being hurt by certain laws, by certain policies, then I think that is my job and that is my role. And I hope that people can take that away from the reporting that gets pushed into the spotlight. A stereotype of ours, the Asian community, is that we stay silent um, yeah. and we don't, we don't talk about these things. But I think that what you have done is really uh, inspired or help you know, folks in our community, especially victims, mm -hmm. come forward you know, with their stories. Are you continuing to get these stories? I mean, it, it, it's probably hard because you know that this is happening way more often than we think. Yeah, that is what keeps me up at night, is knowing that there are so many stories that will never get told. And one just happened yesterday where I reported on the Portola District in San Francisco. It has been a deep-rooted problem of people getting attacked, Asian Americans. I even had a white man who lived in the neighborhood 50-something odd years say, yeah, we all know it happens. It's just nothing gets done. It's a hotbed for criminals because the highway is only a couple blocks away. It's an easy exit on and off. And it's heavily populated along San Bruno Avenue, a lot of Asian American businesses. And <laughs> what I always think about is how many other stories there are. And after I do a story, after I report on it, in my Instagram messages or in my email, I'll get other instances from families. And I got a woman who said, actually two, who said that their own family member had been attacked just down the street, but there was no surveillance video. So when there's no surveillance video, I work in a visual medium and it's not exploitive. It is just being able to illustrate what happens. That's just the nature of what I do. It's not going to reach as many people if, they, if the audience cannot visualize the gravity of, of what is happening. So, you know, I spoke to her, she had no, no surveillance. Another woman who reached out to me right after that story I reported on just days ago said, oh, I'm all for telling the story. My mother's shop had been burned down during the BLM riots. She is in her 70s. She really wanted to restart her business. So she took everything she had, rebuilt it, and only to be va vandalized and victimized and attacked by kids who were under 13 because there was an a juvenile in the case that I had reported on. That's what triggered her to want to speak out. I uh, spent so much time on the phone with her. Bless her heart, truly. She wanted to help. She has surveillance videos of everything. Her mother wants to speak, but one family member is still on the fence. It, he says that he is too triggered by replying to even my messages. He doesn't want to showcase and re-traumatize his mother which I understand, you know, I can't, I can only push so far because unlike other cases where I probably would push very, very hard, I have that empathy now of what it's like because I've lived it. I've seen my mother's fear of reporting a pothole yeah. in a parking lot. What about being attacked <clears throat> and bloodied in your own store? So it's those things I think about often and I get really disappointed, but on the other hand, I can't get too angry because I get it. Well, let's talk about how this all um, impacts you and how it affects you, yeah. especially the, the mental health piece. I think um, for so many of us, this was a hard week. I mean, this was a tough week with the shooting in Texas. And I myself, I, I can't count, you know, how many times I cried. Mm -hmm. For you're at the front line of these things and you're reporting them. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you handle it all? I am pretty much an open book. You'll learn this about me because I said, screw it. You know, what do I have to lose? Um, I had a breakdown, not only behind the scenes, but very publicly on TV for hundreds of thousands of people. 
This was at a time in 2021, the spring, when it felt like every single waking moment, my phone would go off. This is also why I keep them right here, because I have a feeling that something's going to break at any moment. When it was just every day, multiple times a day, people would tell me, they would send me photos of bloodied loved ones. And I thought, this is not normal. But I would keep it inside me for the longest time because my mother, she's wonderful by the way, you know, I bring her up a lot, but how you grow up has a lot to do with how you act and behave now. She told me when I was maybe seven or eight years old that Chinese girls do not cry. The only time I was allowed to cry was when she died because that was the honorable thing. And I held it all in for the longest time. And I interviewed a woman, Mrs. Xu, who lost her son to gun violence. He was studying and he was gunned down senselessly for his cell phone. I remember the story, it did not get very much play because no one wanted to talk from the family. How do you keep it in the news? How do you keep their story alive when it's not even doable without any sound? I had looked for them for months and had given up, and then there was a nonprofit in San Francisco that helped put me in touch with his mother. His mother gave me the most emotional interview I had ever experienced for a solid hour. And mind you, we boil this down to like a one to two minute interview, so I don't normally, I just let her roll. I maybe asked three questions, and she talked the whole time. She was crying, and she pulled down her sweater, and she showed me a heart monitor. And she said, my heart is so broken, I should have been the one that was killed, not my son. And she told me this was the first time in over a year that she had told anybody about what had happened because of the shame. And I went back to the station and I was logging this interview and tears were coming out of my eyes. It was uncontrollable. I started to hyperventilate and I had to stick my head between my legs and I picked up the phone and I remember my hand was barely moving because I think the blood flow had stopped in my hand. But I had enough control that I could dial my manager and I said, I can't do this. I cannot go on. And it was maybe 40 minutes before the newscast, 40 minutes before deadline, and I had nothing written down. And he said, take your time. Don't worry. Let this breathe. You can go beyond two minutes. You can take three. You can take four minutes. It's fine. Just do what you can. I got it together. We made the newscast. But on the newscast, as I was watching the story, I just lost it again. And that is the cardinal sin for people in television. For the longest time, we've been told you cannot cry. You cannot show emotion, right? But I would say during this time, how do you not? Because how do you relate to your audience if you don't also feel pain? And I think that's loosened during the pandemic. You see during these shootings, there was someone very prominent from CNN who was in Buffalo going live. And I remember he also choked up and said, this has been a very tremendous hard time. And that was when I realized that I did need to seek some help. And help has come in different forms, whether it being someone to talk to professionally or finding these allies. I think that's a buzzword nowadays, but it's true. Finding people who are also in the business of what you do and comparing notes, because knowing that you're not alone is probably the most helpful thing. Hmm. Yeah, which is why, by the way, being in this room gives me a lot of hope too, because, and that's why I really wanted to say yes to being here is because knowing that I'm not alone and that we're having these conversations, that also is good for my own mental health. It's an incredible honor to have you here and to be sitting next to you, yeah. <laughs> By the way, audience, we will be taking your questions soon, so make sure you jot them down in, uh, on the question cards, and we'll open it up to questions for Dion soon. Um, you speaking of this way. <laughs> speaking of uh, the industry yeah. and you know your experiences and how people treat you, I mean, as an Asian woman, mm. right? I, and you're so accomplished. Um, how did you how did you break through? How did you get into it? Did you always know you wanted to be in media yeah. and and maybe you know give us some some pointers for any of us who want to stay in the media or yeah. be in the media? <laughs> Let me tell you, it is really hard. You know this. And every day I think to myself, oh my gosh, this is such a battle. And there was a time before the pandemic I wanted to leave the business because I thought, who wants to be at the front lines of terrible things all the time? Because but what has been going on with Asian Americans has given me something to fight for. Um, I would say that the path to doing this 
is really challenging for a number of reasons because the pushback, I mean, it's no surprise, it's no secret. There was a recent study that came out within the last week or so about how not diverse newsrooms across the country are. And I can say that without throwing my own company under the bus because we all know this. We all know that it's not just the people who are in front of the camera who have the byline that matter. It's those editorial team members, the people who are in the positions of power to sign off on the stories, who say, yes, we do want you to do an editorial for the Chronicle. We support you in doing that. And for the longest time, I did not know that I was more than just a number because I would always joke because during my career when I was in Kansas, when I was in North Carolina, people would, you know this story, people would come up to me and they would wave at me and I would be so honored. I'd be like, oh, they, they recognize my work. But in actuality, as soon as they would call me Connie Chung, <laughs> I realized that they did not actually appreciate my work. They just were giving a frame of reference that I was the only other Asian American that they saw on TV. And I had tried the wrong way for the longest time. I talk about this in my book. In those editorial meetings, I remember there was a billboard in Charlotte, North Carolina that said, Jap maples for sale. And clearly there is enough room on the billboard to write Japanese maples for sale, among other plants and foliage, etc. And I remember I came in guns blazing to that meeting and I said, this is a travesty. We really got to change this. I might have used some expletives <laughs> because you know, I mean, I, I was 20 something at the time and I didn't know better. Nobody paid attention to me. They didn't take me seriously. They had no, my bosses had known that I had purchased a tree that had died at that nursery and they thought it was a personal vendetta. And I thought, my goodness, I think it's in the way that we communicate because as Asian Americans, as minorities as a whole, as women as a whole, the way that we approach, you know, things that are important to us to get people on board, there's an art to it, there's a communication to it. And if I could also add just one other thing to that, is that the Obama administration, I love this story so much, uh, there was an op-ed written, I believe in the Washington Post by one of his top aides, that during the first term, it was overwhelmingly men, even though the administration had promoted diversity and inclusion, you know, kudos to that, but they still felt um, overshadowed in those meetings. So they had a technique that they all agreed upon that was called amplification, where one woman ahead of the meeting would say, okay, I'm gonna bring up this idea. And another woman who had already been designated as the amplifier would just repeat it. Mm -hmm. And just by repeating, not by having to be combative, not by raising your voice, that was enough to get other people subconsciously to realize, oh, this is important to more than just one person. So, um, you know, those are just some of the challenges and some of the ways that I think I've had to navigate and learn to overcome these things. So it was not overnight. It was definitely a process. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah, if we can pass your questions this way, I'll actually I'll just go around and collect. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone? No? Yeah. Okay, good. Don't be shy. Oh, oops. Oh. <laughs> you see that. <laughs> there you go. Uh, tissue. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let's see. Open. Oh, yeah, mine's good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Okay. So there you the, go. the only part of my body that I'm, I'm good at or have control over is my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. I can't even open a bottle of water. Sorry. <laughs> you, should, you should see at dinner break, like all my like TV outfits are like covered in food sometimes. I need to wear an apron. All the magic of the camera, right? Totally. Totally. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. Question from the audience. What will be your call for action for everyone? In everyday life, oh. there is usually a lot of attention on Asian hate crime after an incident, but what will be your advice on consistent effort to help improve the status quo? I love this. Clapping to whoever made that. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> because yeah. I think some people always say, Dion, you cover so much hate. It's so depressing. It's so hard. And I think this year I've really had to ask myself, especially after the one year anniversary of the Atlanta spa shootings, is how are we going to advance the story? Because 
don't get me wrong, I think their attention is still on AAPI issues, but I think the momentum has slowed because people have become a little bit desensitized to these issues because no longer is it newsworthy to showcase one attack. It has to be multiple, all in one neighborhood, for example. So I would say people are oftentimes afraid that it requires a rally or, you know, spearheading a conversation like this to, to do your part. But that education component does not require going on to Google and doing your research or seeking out a professor and having a one-on-one -on -one with them. I think it is as simple as incorporating the Asian American lens and point of view into everyday life. I actually have one for you. It is a cupcake at a place called Sweet Diplomacy, which is Asian owned. Uh, it's in Los Altos. I brought it for you specifically oh, wow. in case this question came up because it's, it's, it's as small as this sounds, it is a way to highlight and to ask questions. And if you ask me what is interesting about this cupcake, right, something so easily integrated into everyone's day, I would say, well, they use mochi flour. Mochi flour is used in X, Y, and Z. And look, it's lower in gluten. And it's also not as sweet as normal cupcakes, well, other cupcakes, I should say. And that really plays to the Asian palate. So something as small as that and educating people that what our, contribu our contributions to society are, are not abnormal, I think gets subconsciously into the everyday that we are not foreigners, and therefore we should not be under attack. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, boba tea is pretty popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boba brings the world together. It might end up being you know, America's favorite treat I if it's not so. already. To be honest, it's like yeah. you know, you go to the UK and their national food is Indian curry. food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> chicken tikka masala. Yeah, right. Um, would like to hear your opinion about social media. Oh, <laughs> 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 um, uh, let me finish the question. Where everyone can speak out. How can we pick up uh, the the? How can we pick up the best information? Yeah. Look, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I mean, there are people who think that what I do is misinformation. So those accounts, but I will, there are some that come to mind right away. I won't name them for the sake of not embarrassing anybody or throwing anybody under the bus, but there are accounts out there that just like to get clout, right? Clicks and likes, because that's really your social currency on social media is what is going to get the most attention. And unfortunately, and you saw this with the Facebook investigation last year, the whistleblower that came out and said, oh, there are a lot of harmful things that are on social media, but it's those harmful things that get people riled up. And that conversation then feeds the algorithm. And that's why more people will like something that is controversial or someone getting beat up and dragged on the ground, as horrific as it is, than me showcasing a young man who could receive the Congressional Art Award for his art of anti-AAPI hate. So I would say just really remember the role of where it's coming from. If an account is there to, show, to say, here are three black people beating up on Asian people, how do they know? Have they gone to the police? Have they actually vetted all this information? What you don't realize is they may be first to market, but for me it causes a problem because if I'm going to do all the research and the legwork, I'm gonna have producing teams behind me also giving me the assistance yeah, I'm gonna be a day behind. Is that gonna screw up the algorithm? Yeah, fewer people are gonna see that, but I would much rather have it be right than it get a lot of clicks and likes. So I really encourage people to know where this is coming from. And before you wanna share something, even though it's scandalous and it's horrible, figure out what it is first, because I can't tell you how many times people have sent me videos alleging there was wrongdoing, when really what we're seeing is something totally different. Mm -hmm. It's teaching us how to be a credible journalist. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting so much from this talk. <laughs> okay, what's your next step in your career and or life? You are already very accomplished, but oh what is your next move? Oh, this is a tough question. I get this question a lot. My mom asks me that a lot, too. <laughs> I think she wants to know how much I make, too, because oh that's goodness. the first question. She equates success with how much money is on your paycheck. Um, you know, I have to say this. I would recommend to everybody, when I first got in this business, I had this path carved out in my mind that I would be at the network level. I would be X, Y, and Z before I was 30 years old. Well, 30 came and went a long time ago. And if you ever told me that I would work in Kansas, if you ever told me that I'd 
be in San Francisco doing what I do today, I would be laughing. Because what you have in mind oftentimes is not the way life comes at you. Um, I would love to continue telling stories. I would like to see how I could maybe amplify these stories more on a broader scale. But as I discovered, because I recently filled in for ABC News for a week in April, which was very exciting for me to be on a national stage. But as I discovered, even though I'm on the national stage, I didn't actually during that week get a chance to make any phone calls to you know, victims of crime or actually dig and find my own stories because that's not how it works at the network level, you know? I mean, you have to be in a, a different role for that. So I think what I had in my mind of what I would say that my goal for my career was isn't what I expected it to be. So now I just want to figure out a way, can I continue to tell these stories meaningfully and to an even broader audience? How that happens, I don't know. But one thing is for certain, I have enjoyed participating in talks like this. And then also, whenever there is a large company, their DNI team says, hey, can you talk about the work you do for our employees and the employees have no clue what's going on that makes me think that the work still has to be done and if those conversations can continue throughout the rest of the year not just in may when the spotlight is on aapi then uh that's what i would like to do at least in the near future amazing what do you think is the best strategy to communicate with someone who is on the opposite end of the ideology of the ideological, I can't speak today, uh, <laughs> spectrum. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you just can't. Sometimes you can't engage. And I think we saw that oftentimes uh, with the rhetoric that was used, uh, calling, you know, COVID Kung flu and, 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 you know, the Asian virus. Because if you tried to explain yourself to those individuals, it was like talking to a brick wall. So unfortunately, I get a lot of criticism and feedback from the audience, and I realize that I have to let it go. Oftentimes, you cannot, under any circumstances, engage. But oftentimes, I also think that the facts do not, do not lie. And if we have a professor of Asian American Studies, Dr. Russell Jung, uh, who I work closely with, he was one of the co-founders of Stop AAPI Hate, that reporting center that, as of to date, has recorded more than 11,000 instances of attacks, verbal and physical, across America. Um, you know, when he has figures and facts for me, I try to use those because the, how do you argue against a study? How do you combat that? And oftentimes the people say, oh, well, thank you very much, and then they stop. So while it's not a complete answer, it is the best way that we can, and, and also continuing the work too, because after a while, it's undeniable to say that what is happening today is a problem. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you for what you have done for journalism and the Asian American community. I'm a writer by profession. For many years, I have seen how difficult for Asians and Asian Americans to be featured in mainstream literature. Mm -hmm. As I see it, we need to have voices in art, literature, journalism, politics, and many other areas. How do you think we can achieve that? Wow. You know, I think that allyship component comes to mind because you look at pop culture today and a lot of movies. I mean, as recent as Austin Powers. Do you remember in Austin Powers, there was like a fembots that were all Asian and they were all these like little perky girls in pink with like feathered boas and things. And then Full Metal Jacket, that movie and the phrase, me love you long time. And these ways that these terrible stereotypes have really crept into pop culture and embedded themselves, I think has been exceptionally harmful. So when it comes to journalism, I am very aware now, even if we are doing a story where we require man on the street interviews, meaning someone's opinion on a certain topic, I will seek out diverse voices. Because again, subconsciously, if we have all white faces, for example, commenting on an issue. Just yesterday, I was at a high school in San Ramon that had racist graffiti on a boy's bathroom wall. It was a caricature that was very offensive of George Floyd. And I made a point to ask not only kids who were black, but kids of all races and backgrounds. Because if people can see that allyship of speaking out, maybe that encourages someone else in a very small micro way to do the same. 
we'll take any last questions before we before I answer I ask the last question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask the last question. As you should. <laughs> Oops. All right. Um, can you speak on how to better engage AAPI community given the diversity within this community? Yeah, that's a good question too because yeah. I think so oftentimes people think AAPI Heritage Month what comes to mind is Chinese people or Japanese people. And we forget so oftentimes that there are many of us in the community. So it has to be a conscious decision and it has to be not being afraid from our side to come out and speak about issues. For example, when the one year anniversary of the spa shootings happened, I did a talk for a large company that was predominantly Indian American and Pakistani. And I had a number of people, I was really surprised, who said, we felt the pain that you felt as well, even though we are not Korean or whatever background the demographic of the victims were in that shooting, but we did not feel comfortable coming out because we did not know how to show solidarity. We did not know if we had a place or a voice. And I think different Asian American groups need to say, yeah, we welcome that and we value your thoughts and your comments. And even if you don't know how to show solidarity, just by amplifying a story or just asking, how are you doing? Or, hey, this affected me too, really goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To add to that, so the, my last question is, I mean, it, it has felt very scary as an AAPI woman. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as I'm reading more and I'm hearing more, um, sometimes I had been shocked to hear stats, like even in the corporate boardroom, mm. that Asian women don't make up or don't, it's very little that, you know, we show up even on the executive level. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then so to add to that, the, the violence that we face, I think Stop AAPI Hate recorded that 60% of those incidents affected women, yes. AAPI women. And so I'd love for you to leave us with, you know, your your final thoughts, um, but especially a message for us as Asia, Asian women and leadership and why it's so important for us to not just be at the table, yeah. but we really need to be the decision makers as well. Oh, a thousand percent. And before I answer that question, talk about being a good consumer, a good steward of news consumption. Even with the study of Stop AAPI Hate, that's just a springboard, right? Because this is a self-reporting portal. None of the incidents are necessarily vetted, but it gives people a number at least. It does give gravity to an incident. So that's another way to just kind of, you know, question all of the data that comes in. I would say this, it is scary out there. It is challenging and yes you are going to get pushed back no matter what i do to this day after that interview with the district attorney i got pushed back even from another journalist who i will not name who is not asian american who said wow and i overheard this dion was really mean to the district attorney but would that same criticism be made to a white man or someone else or a male of any color doing a tough interview, shoving a microphone or holding someone accountable? I don't think so. So I would say, was that time for me scary? Yeah, because I was, my blood was boiling at that time and my blood continues to boil whenever I am on a story where I need to ask elected leaders or law enforcement, hey, how come it took two hours to respond to this woman who was attacked in her front yard. But I would say this, that for every time you use your voice, every time you are not afraid, it gives you the strength to continue and to be louder, to be bolder, that one day, if you do meet the president, you can ask him to move his arm. Uh, and it, it, I, I really think that I would not have done that had I not had the experiences I had now today. So I would say as scary as it can be, know that you do have people in your corner. And I understand you have jobs on the line. I understand that you have family because trust me, my mother and I do not see eye to eye ideology, you know, wise. And it has caused a rift, for sure. 
but I have to keep going because at the end of the day, your own convictions and you have to live with how you conduct yourself at the end of the day. And I want to be able to go home and lay my head on that pillow and say to myself, I did everything that I could because to be passive and to not use your voice, because every one of you has a seat at the table right now, to me is just as bad as being complicit and the person who is committing the wrongdoing to our community. Dion, you're so amazing, and you're everything that we uh, we look for in right community leadership and also voice for us. And thank you so much for doing the work that you do. The honor is Thank you so much, everyone. For coming, I know that many of you would love to have some alone time with, I'm sure, both of the speakers, actually. We are on a little bit of a tight schedule. I believe you're going to the studio. Yeah, I have to go soon. to the news, that whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll tell you what, this is this is the plan. Um, we have 14 books left. They're 28 bucks flat. We're going to uh, round down for you so that uh, I drove to San Francisco to pick them up myself. Oh, my God, thank you. And um, I really want to support your amazing work thank and you. your voice. And I hope that we sell out of the books. So um, I think the best way to do this is everyone can make their way to the food and the drinks. Um, mm -hmm. We're, we're going to wrap up with uh, just the, uh, the founders of the Society for Slate can stay behind. And, um, and then um, we have a vol vol your volunteer, right, <laughs> helping out. Thank you so much for helping. <laughs> uh, if you can take down people's name, and then we'll go around and just to keep it moving fast, and then um, either cash or Venmo. Uh, would work if you can get a list of people's name who want who want the books and help with that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. What's it about? It's a money transfer app. So I mean, oh, I don't know. 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 Uh, media club. Toga. The media club of Saratoga High School volunteer to help film and Lam, who work, you work for uh, City Council uh, Cohen's office. Yeah. We have actually several people here who are working for elected officials on the uh, city and county level. So uh, state. There you go. State. There you go. <laughs> state. That's right. That's right. Evan Lowe's office. Right. Okay. Welcome. Yeah. So we have. And then we also have a Simidian, right? Uh, a, a supervisor of Simidian's office represented here. So um, anyhow, if you would love to get one of those uh, remaining 14 books, please see Jesse, and we'll write down the Venmo, and um, then uh, uh, Dion uh, Lam will be in the in the um, Lim will be in the tea room to meet with you and sign the book. Thank you so much. Maybe. One um, announcement. Yes. Shameless plug. So sorry. Do it. <laughs> Do it. You Do have it. to be shameless. But it's so hey. exciting. It's so exciting. <laughs> and you're the first to hear it. But um, wow. oh. for more programs coming up, visit commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for all the programs that I produce. The program I wanted to let you know, I hope you're, you all are uh, will attend, is one with Ambassador Chantal Wong, who was appointed by President Biden to lead the Asian Development Bank. And so we'll talk about how she plans uh, economic policies to influence LGBTQ rights around the world. It's Amazing. going to be fascinating. Wow. Wow. That's wonderful.